even in what we be what we call lucid dreams, dreams in which you are aware that you are dreaming. So you are conscious in the dream. Elements of the dream still escape your consciousness, even though all of this has been generating by the one brain, by you. Hi, I'm Brilliant, your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. I created this podcast and the School for Good Living to share what I've learned and to keep exploring the question, what does it mean to live a good life and how can we do it? Despite my privilege, I lived for decades in a pretty dark place, and I know that living is often a painful, difficult, and messy business. But I also know that it can be wonderful beyond imagination, and that it's a skill at which we can improve. That's why every episode is a conversation with an author who's an expert regarding spirituality, health, relationships, work, rest, and play, or money. I also ask my guests about their creative habits, routines, and mindsets, and what they've done to get their books written, published, and read. If you're ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. If you are interested to understand yourself, the world, life at a deeper level, and you want to understand dreams, what they are, where they come from, how we can use them, why they even happen, you'll like today's guest, Dr. Tony Zadra, author of Wind Brain's Dream, Exploring the Science and Mystery of Sleep. Dr. Zadra conducts research focused on the scientific study of dreams, including everyday dreams, nightmares, and lucid dreams, as well as sleep terrors and sleepwalking. Together with his students and a team of collaborators, he's published over 100 research articles. He's collected thousands of dream reports firsthand over a number of decades. Dr. Zadra, in addition to writing Wind Brain's Dream, is co-authored with Dr. Stickgold, Bob Stickgold, who works at Harvard. In this book, these authors offer a new theory of why we dream. I think it's interesting. I think it's useful. I've had a dream when I was young that changed the course of my life, multiple actually. So this is a subject I've personally been fascinated by for a long time. And one of the things that I love is that Dr. Zadra has taken a very scientific approach while being very open to other possibilities and helped advance our understanding of sleep and dreams. So this is a book I really enjoyed. If you're interested in understanding yourself better, sleep, dreams, I think you will too. You can learn more about Dr. Zadro at antoniozadra.com, which is Z-A-D-R-A dot com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Dr. Z Dreams. All right, with that, I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Tony Zadra. Tony, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here. Tony, will you tell me, please, what's life about? Life is about making the best of the opportunities that present themselves to us. Life is about um, enjoying as much as we can in the moment and not getting too carried away about things good or bad, especially bad in the past, or fretting too much about what awaits us. So it's, it's planning for the future, but making sure you are savoring uh, all the good things uh, or trying to overcome the bad things in the now. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. On your website, there's a description in the top left corner under your name. Sleep scientist, aneronaut, yeah. author. Will you tell me what's an aneronaut? Am I even saying that right? Aneronaut. Aneronaut is an old term, but it means explorer of the dream world. And so for some, it's more a scientific exploration, but the intended meaning of that word is more someone who explores their internal dream world. So it's really exploring your own uh, dreams, uh, the characters in them, the settings in them. So it's someone who actively attempts to, like I said, learn more about themselves or about their dreams, but while they are dreaming, while in the dream. How and why did you choose to follow this path? And uh, perhaps how did you make a career of it? Well, this might sound um, a little corny maybe, but it is actually because of a dream that I had, uh, literally. And so when I was in college, uh, my intention was to follow in my older brother's footsteps, to go to medical school. 
Um, not because necessarily I had a passion for medicine, but that seemed to be the route that would open the most doors and so on. And while in college, I had this really long, exceptionally vivid dream, which ended up, I only learned later, had a name. So it was a lucid dream. It was a dream in which I became aware that I was dreaming. And there's fantastic things that took place in that dream, including some uh, conversations with dream characters. This is the first dream I ever wrote down. And subsequent to that dream, I started reading more about dreams, about REM sleep, uh, sleep in general. And over the next few months, I decided that if there was such a thing as a dream scientist, that's what I wanted to do. At the time, mind you, I was also, I got into the books by like Carlos Castaneda. And so I was wondering, oh, maybe it's, you know, I should be looking at uh, becoming an anthropologist. So I was really open to all kinds of things. I was reading about uh, Tibetan Buddhism with relationship to dreams, so these more ancient traditions. And finally, I decided, well, psychology is probably the venue that would offer me the most opportunities to study the clinical sides of dreams, psychophysiology of dreams, and neurobiology. And so I made the decision not to go to medical school, assuming I would have gotten in, and to study or give it a shot to study dreams instead. And I would like to take a moment just to acknowledge that, whereas many people in my immediate surroundings were kind of alarmed by that, you're going to do what? You're going to try to study <laughs> what? Like, like, what kind of job are you going to get? I want to point out that my mom thought that studying dreams was an absolutely great and fine alternative to medical school. And at the time, she told me, you put your mind to it, everything will work out. And so I literally followed my dreams. Wow, that's great. And how wonderful to have a mother like that. Uh, that was, and yes, absolutely. But she's been very supportive ever since for all kinds of different projects. That's awesome. So you've written this book. Part of what your work includes now is uh, having published recently this book, When Brains Dream. Exploring the Science and Mystery of Sleep, which I read, I loved. Uh, I found it fascinating both how you look back at the history of thought and understanding related to sleep and dreams in particular, but then also you have offered your own theory of yes. why we dream, what dreams are about. And, and I'll get to that, but let me, let me start by asking, why did you write this book? Who did you write it for and, and why? Uh, that's a very good question. I didn't really have plans for writing a uh, general public book on dreams, but myself and a few colleagues were starting to get, I guess, almost irritated with, is be the uh, right word, uh, just about all the myths and misconceptions about dreams that we would read in popular articles and media and so on. And so originally we had intended, uh, we being uh, a group of six, seven uh, researchers in the field to write an article saying, you know, here's like the 10 most common myths about dreams or misunderstandings. And then one of those people that was involved in this idea said, you know, it might also make a good book. And then we started, and this person is my co-author, uh, Bob Stickgold, uh, who's a researcher at Harvard University. And so we started playing around with this idea and thinking, well, what would we cover? What would be fun about this? And finally, we decided, okay, let's go for it. And so this is where the idea came from. And then as we bounced around ideas back and forth, then the different things we want maybe to address in the book sort of started materializing. And when we started writing this book, you mentioned there's a model in there about why we dream, but that was not at all, we hadn't thought about the model. It wasn't the reason we were writing the book. It Those ideas really came forth through the writing of the book. And we actually had to stop at one point and write to the editor and saying, okay, now, now we have this other thing we want to put in the book and where do we put it in and where? Uh, and finally they said, well, could you maybe put it uh, somewhere towards the middle and then use this model to explain other phenomena related to dreams? 
And that ended up being, I think, a very good suggestion because it, initially we were just going to keep all of that for the very end. And it also forced us to think, okay, since we're going to be talking about lucid dreams or uh, nightmares and so on, how does our model about dreams help us understand these phenomena? And so it was a, that's sort of the origins of the project, and but also the actual writing and thinking about it was a lot of fun. Um, and it also was, in, in many respects, a, a good challenge because as uh, scientists were used to writing more you know, in-depth scientific articles, which are, you know, might be sound a little obtuse uh, and very detailed and technical to general readership. And so it was, we, on the one hand, didn't want to oversimplify things. On the other hand, we wanted people to have an enjoyable read while sort of catching on to the nuances of what's been done or current thoughts and so on. So it it was a fun exercise also in learning to write differently and for a different audience. Yeah. That's awesome. So if I'm understanding what you're saying, you and a group of researchers would would convene regularly. You talk about just what you're learning, research, this kind of thing. You're having this conversation about what people don't understand or popular misconceptions about dreams. And you have the idea to write an entire book about that. Yes. But like I said, originally, we wanted to write a sort of a general, fairly short article addressing Here's the six. And we had we had this talk really informally over uh, supper and a few beers at a conference, at a sleep conference. And someone mentioned, oh, did you read that article in whatever magazine it was? And we said, yes. And it's it's really sad that, you know, these misconceptions are still put forth as truths. And and it was and then someone said, yeah, and there was this article in this other magazine where they also said this, which is blatantly false. And. And so that's where we started saying, now maybe we should do something and sort of all get together and write sort of a position paper or something that would help correct these myths. But then two of us, a subgroup, uh, Bob Stinkle and I started thinking, okay, well, we could expand this and work it into a book. And then instead of being a short book about, hey, here's the top 10 myths about dreams, it became something much bigger as we were planning it. And, and then we got sort of, I wouldn't say carried away, but very excited by the thought, okay, what would we want people to learn about dreams? And also trying to think, what are the kinds of questions about dreams that we are most often asked when we give public lectures or teach a class on sleep and dreams? And to make sure that we try to address those questions uh, in the book, which is why there's a a whole chapter there on sort of telepathic precognitive dreams, not something scientists would normally be writing about. And most uh, even popular books about dreams, let alone academic ones, there's a lot of those topics that you will not find in them. But I explicitly wanted to have something about how can people use their dreams for self-discovery? How can we explain or understand these unusual forms of dreaming? Because those are the things people want to know about. Yeah, for sure. And then also, if I'm understanding that as you and Bob worked this, what was going to be this relatively short book to set the record straight on misconceptions about dreams, that then from there, as you move forward with that and it expanded, and I imagine by that point, you probably had a publishing agreement. Yes. Yes. So then you have a publishing agreement, you have a plan and a direction for your project. And then somewhere along the way, you get this next up concept, which I'll ask you to explain (laughs) in a bit. But then you have this model of dreaming that emerges from it. And you say, hey, this is valuable. Like, let's include this somewhere. But that wasn't part of the original intent. You are absolutely correct. And the original idea, the kernel of idea for Next Up actually came, uh, it wasn't my idea, it was Bob's idea. And it came through a, again, this might sound uh, fantastical or whatever, convenient, but it's the truth, uh, came from a few sleep periods that he had. I mean, he did not dream about these things, but these ideas were sort of forming in his mind over about a one-week period where he was at in Cape Cod, where his wife was giving these uh, classes, and he was just there enjoying the beach and the sunshine. And uh, for over a period of a week, when he would wake up in the morning, he'd have these ideas uh, floating around his mind about what is the brain trying to do? Why do we dream? And of course, much of that 
uh, was related to the material we were writing and we had already started all of that. So he was immersed in these ideas, but there was sort of these really novel, interesting ways of thinking about the questions and so on. And then he sent me an email saying, you know, uh, Tony, tell me if I'm crazy or does this make sense? But I'm getting this, you know, I'm, I'm working on this idea, but maybe why we dream. And so there was a description in this email and I wrote back and I went, wow, that's really cool. You're not crazy. And, you know, uh, and so then we started exchanging and, and then it took more and more room. And then we said, well, maybe we should put this in the book. Wow. As, as that's we're awesome. Forth. So I'm so fascinated by the creative process. So I just wanted to be sure that I understood some of the twists and turns of your yeah. own <laughs> project here. So thank you for, for sharing that. And, and so many other questions are coming up for me and probably for those listening. Let me ask you this. You mentioned, okay, so I've got to ask this while we're on the thread about these misconceptions. What's one that you really, like what's something that most people either don't understand or they, they just don't know or they get wrong? Like what's one of these misconceptions that, that you with your knowledge and experience wanted to, to really kind of correct the record on? Well, one of the most common ones is that dreaming is equivalent to REM sleep. Uh, REM sleep is a particular sleep stage, and it is where most vivid, narrative, narratively driven emotional dreams take place. Uh, but many people equate the two, uh, including researchers. And so people do research on, uh, for instance, on REM sleep in mice or rats. And then they'll say, oh, we see that in REM sleep, this happens. So dreams must have this function. Well, as far as we know, mice don't have dreams. I mean, we have yet to woke, wake up a mouse and the mouse tells us, oh, wow, so that was so cool because, you know, I was in my cage and this was going on and this. And so, you know, REM sleep is a physiological state. It's a, a, sleep, uh, a state of sleep that's very unique, that's fascinating. But when we want to know what is the function of dreams or what do dreams do, we're not referring to, oh, serotonin levels are up. Like, no one wakes up in the morning or and goes, brilliant. You won't believe what I dreamt last night. So I had this experience where my hippocampus was shutting down. And then you won't <laughs> believe this, but acetylcholine wasn't even being released between my neurons. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> No, it's the subjective experience. That's what fascinates people. It's like, oh man, I was in my car and then I was stuck in traffic, but then this eagle arrived and lifted the car away. And, you know, it's the subjective experience. So if we're interested in explaining why we dream, what we're trying to explain is why do we have these subjective experiences that we are conscious of that we sometimes recall when we awaken? Because all the rest of the stuff that uh, sleep it does, it can very well do without us becoming, having these subjective experiences. So we have a lot of stuff going on in the brain while we sleep. And much of it is done, if you want, in the background. I mean, we don't have to be thinking about it and there doesn't have to be these unusual experiences we call dreams. And so to get back to your question about misconceptions, it's that A, that dreams only take place in REM sleep, which is untrue. And B, the two are sort of interchangeable concepts. And like I said, REM sleep is, is a physiological state uh, that has its own properties, but dreams are a subjective experience. And so the question is, what's the added value of having this subjective experience on top of whatever sleep is doing outside of our awareness? Yeah, that's right. And such a fascinating question. And, and one for me that you know, I'm really amazed by that there's not, despite at least hundreds of years of, you know, some sort of scientific rigor exploring virtually everything <laughs> that we still don't know. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, and one thing I appreciate about your book is the way you explain what a dream even is, because I think it could be, I think it makes sense that it could be challenging to understand why we dream you know, or what the benefits of dreams might be and this kind of thing, if we don't even agree or understand what a dream is. So maybe this is a place to start. How do you define dream? What does okay. it mean to dream? What is a dream? So for us, and like many researchers in the field, dreams are really 
any kind of subjective experience that we have while we are asleep. And so they are at one extreme. It could be these bodily sensations, these isolated or fleeting thoughts that we have or concerns, all the way to the other extreme where we have these really complex, vivid, multi-sensory experiences, which, you know, in these virtual dream worlds where we run away from characters or we fall in love or have an angry boss yell at us. And, and so all of these, which are real on a continuum, are all dreams. And so we don't, because otherwise you sort of have to draw an artificial line somewhere and saying, oh, well, that's more just like a thinking uh, in your sleep. So it's not really a dream because there's no social interactions there. There's no emotions. Uh, but again, this to us is a bit artificial. And what we know about dreams also is that the dreams you might have in certain stages of sleep can be much more simpler and in other stages of sleep get much more complex and narratively driven and get more bizarre and get more emotional. But this is all on the continuum. It's like saying, you know, if I'm just resting, uh, enjoying a cup of tea, uh, listening to a bit of music, that's not wakefulness. Wakefulness is just when you're running about and interacting with people at parties or this or that. Or uh, No, it's all on a continuum. Our, our waking uh, experiences are on a continuum. And you can be, you know, meditating and being really quiet. And that can be very valuable. And that's wakefulness, too. And so you don't have to be engaged. And so to me, same things can be said about dreams. They're read on a, on a continuum. But the other thing we try also to explain is what a tricky concept dreams are. And probably one that most of us as adults take for granted because the concept of dreams is something that we are taught as we often, as we grow up. Most kids, you know, they, they, they wake up from a bad dream or a nightmare, and then they go into their parents' room and go, mommy, mommy, there's a monster in my room. And uh, But for them, these experiences are real. The reason they want to sleep in, the, in their parents' bed, whatever, is that, hey, I'm not going back in my bedroom. There's, there's this monster under the bed or in my closet or, you know, I'm staying here. And then when the parents say, oh, no, honey, it was just a dream. The first time you hear that, you know, and you're not familiar with the word, children usually have no idea what their parents mean. What do you mean a dream? Does that mean there's a, it was just a toy? It was a ghost? Uh, is it that it's my Uncle Bob that's dressed up as a monster? Is it that there's these real creatures living under my bed, but they're hopefully harmless? I mean, what is dream? It's not really helpful. And it takes a while for children to understand that uh, dreams are private experiences, that is, they're subjective, that someone in your bedroom cannot see them as they are unfolding, that they are imaginary, that they don't pl take place in real physical worlds, uh, though some adults still believe that. And so it's a concept that we sort of grow to understand and adapt. And then uh, that can have different meanings to people depending on their other kinds of beliefs, religious, otherwise spiritual. Some people are convinced that, you know, if they have dreams of people who have passed away, it is really an essence of these people visiting them. So it's open to many different views and interpretations, but becoming familiar that we have these experiences that we call dreams it really takes a while to sort of wrap our head around and even how we are able to perceive uh, dreams, like see things in our dreams and hear things in our dreams, even though we're in bed sleeping. And so I give the example of like when my uh, nephew Sebastian was about five years old, I had this conversation with him and said, oh, Sebastian, to you, do you sometimes remember your dreams? And he goes, yes, of course. And, and he knew of my interest of, of dreams. And so I asked him, oh, okay, and like, where do they take place? And he looks at me and goes, well, they, they take place in front of me. And I said, in front of you, how? Well, they're just in front of me. I, I, I see my dreams with my eyes. And I went, okay, cool. And when you see them with your eyes there, are you, are you awake or are you asleep? 
And then he looks at me like I'm nuts again. He goes, well, I'm asleep, of course. And tell me, Sebastian, do you sleep with your eyes open or closed? Well, they're closed. So if you're asleep and your eyes are closed, how do you see the dream? And then usually there's a pause. And then he calls my sister. Mom, Uncle Tony's asking me those crazy questions again, right? <laughs> so now I have my own children, so I can do those tests with. <laughs> but again, it goes to show that, you you know, it takes a while to sort of wrap your head around, okay, my eyes are closed, but I see things, you know, I'm quietly asleep in my bed, but I'm moving these virtual worlds. How is this possible? Who else is there? And when, when I wake up, where does that world go? Does it continue? Does it disappear? And so again, the whole concept of dreams is really quite tricky and probably one of the reasons it's played such an important role historically in how we try to uh, explain life, explain death, how the universe works. Uh, and so we know that dreams have played important roles in our conceptions of the universe, in our a way we try to explain uh, life, even in the foundation of many kinds of religions, uh, because they're such uh, intriguing and potentially powerful experiences that sort of elude our understanding. Yeah, no, no question. And I think it's really interesting that dreams are something that we all experience, but I think collectively we don't have a great understanding of, and in some way, we just kind of dismiss them, ignore them, overlook them, set them aside. And I've had the chance to, to explore some other cultures to some degree, including visiting an indigenous tribe in the, in the Ecuadorian Amazon rainforest and to participate with them in, in their morning Wayusa ceremony, where they drink tea and talk about their dreams with each other. And our guide explained to us that the Achuar there believe that the dream world is somehow a mirror of our world, but it's every bit as real. And I was reminded how another culture can have a concept that's so different. Like to them, it determines if they'll hunt that day, where they'll hunt, you know, maybe what they eat, who they'll interact with, this kind of thing. And I think where I'm going with this whole thing is just to ask, you know, your view on when other cultures have a view of the dream world is as real and as meaningful, like as impacting on the day-to-day -day activities, why do you think it is that we don't as a society? Why is that? Why is it not something that seems to have an equal amount of, I would say, influence in our, in our daily living? That's an excellent question, by the way. And I think it's because we, as a culture, uh, don't value dreams. I mean, we don't really value sleep. I mean, a lot of people are proud to show up at work and saying, oh, I'm here and I only slept four hours last night because I worked till two in the morning, whatever. Um, and again, uh, uh, dreams are really not uh, something that we value either as a source of potential self-knowledge of introspection, uh, let alone as something that could potentially guide our behaviors. And again, you know, before when I was mentioning that, you know, most of us probably heard, first heard about the word dream as a negative, you know, oh, don't worry, honey, it was just a dream. Uh, so if if a child comes to you and says, oh, you know, I, I had this, I was falling and I was just free falling and I woke up and I was scared. Uh, again, you could say it was just a dream or you could say, Wow, that's a wonderful experience. Next time you're falling, why don't you try to change the falling into flying? Try to land somewhere. Uh, see who's there waiting for you. Go explore that world. See, already there's a whole shift from, oh, this is irrelevant. Forget about it. It's the dream and, you know, versus, you know, something that's more encouraging and creative. And so in some of these cultures, it's a whole other way of not just explaining the experience as something potentially real or that the sources aren't from inside our minds, but from these outer powers that sort of can communicate or send messages to us or uh, hold kinds of knowledge that we don't have direct access to when we are awake. So it's a whole different way of conceptualizing these nocturnal experiences, but also encouraging people from an early age to value them, which yeah, we no, generally don't do. I can see that for sure. So 
you've talked a little bit about how bizarre some of our dreams are, and we've explored a bit about the intersection of the dreaming world and the waking world, as though they're two separate things. <laughs> but I want to I want to ask you about an article you wrote that was titled "Dreaming is Like Taking LSD." <laughs> And will you talk about that? Why, why is that so? Okay. What do you mean by that? Well, when people take or when people used to take uh, LSD or other substances, psilocybin known as uh, magic mushrooms, they have a known effect on the brain on a neurotransmitter called serotonin. And one feature of when people take these substances other than, you know, visual hallucinations or auditory misperceptions, is this feeling that their experiences are imbued with really profound meaning, right? And there are many anecdotes of people, you know, on an acid trip, and then they, they noted these profound revelations. And then, you know, after the trip, they read their notes, and it says things like, there's a funny smell in the room. Or in the example given in the article, when you flush the toilet, everything goes down, but the, everything is, you know, uh, highlighted and underlined. Like, and people say, oh, there was much more to it than that. And so the brain enters a state where, again, many things, whether it's lyrics and music or sounds or a particular tree in the forest, if we're walking somewhere, or a bird that we see really takes on this really important significance uh, in this altered state of consciousness. But it so happens that in REM sleep, where our most vivid dreaming take place, there's the same pattern of activation with respect to the same neurotransmitter. And so the brain is in a state that's not that unlike uh, in terms of this neurotransmitter than when you take acid. And so we think that one of the reasons our dreams, even the most bizarre ones, seem so meaningful to us is because the brain is in a state that it's receptive to, um, again, imparting a sense of meaningfulness to the dream. And it's also probably what drives people when they wake up to want to sometimes share their dreams, to tell dreams to others, even though others tend to go, yeah, okay, are you done? <laughs> that was not as interesting to me as it was to you. But to them, they're sort of like, look, this was important. It was powerful or or there was some meaning to it or, or even, you know, this whole interest in what does this dream mean? And so, so the parallel between the LSD and dreaming is that in some respects, the brain finds itself in the same neurochemical bath that... Uh, favors are attributing meaning to our experience. And we think that's really important when it comes to dreams, because then we react to them and take them seriously while we are immersed in them. And that thing, by the way, that you talked about, you know, people wanting to share their dreams upon waking <laughs> as I was getting ready for this interview this morning. And I told my wife I'd be interviewing you. She told me of the dream she just woke up from. <laughs> I was like, okay. All right. So from here, I want to ask you, man, there's so much I want to ask. I'm not going anywhere. So that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this, we've talked about how dreaming is a bit like, or a lot like being on LSD and appropriately enough, researchers have studied some of these Psy phenomenon, telepathic precognition in dreams at a Grateful Dead concert. Yes. <laughs> Will you talk about that? Why do they do it? What do they discover? Okay. And so, first of all, the, the interest in sort of telepathic dreams uh, really goes back uh, centuries, if not millennia. Uh, but even people like uh, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung wrote about them. Uh, and so, the idea that it might be uh, possible to communicate with people while they are asleep and dreaming through telepathy uh, was something not easily dismissed if even these greats at the time wrote about them. What's less known is that, yeah, in the 60s, there are these researchers who became particularly interested in this question and wanted to know, can we sort of telepathically 
send information to someone who is asleep uh, and dreaming in a laboratory. And so some of these ideas was, well, we'd have six artworks, each one in an envelope, and randomly when the person entered REM sleep, they'd have someone who's the sender open one of these envelopes, look at the image, and try just mentally to convey the sense of the image to the sleeper, and then you can wake them up at the lab and see what they were dreaming about, and there's correspondences. And so these are the kinds of studies that some people were doing in the 1960s. But then one of these uh, researchers, Stanley Krippner, uh, was able to convince the Grateful Dead uh, over a series of six concerts to at one point stop their show and on the screen behind them tell the audience, you're about to take part in a dream experiment. And one of our participants is actually in Brooklyn sleeping in our sleep lab. And we want you to try to transmit through telepathy the following image to them. And so, uh, well, people tried. And unbeknownst to them, uh, there was also a second person who is not mentioned uh, on the screen, who is also supposed to be trying to receive uh, these images. Now, the evidence, the upshot of all this is the evidence is sort of, you know, there's no conclusive evidence that this worked because, well, if there was, we'd all know about it and goes, goes oh, yes, we know that dream telepathy exists for, we've known it for 40 years. But what we do know, however, is that on a few occasions, there have been correspondences that seem to, are not easily explainable and that do not seem to be due to chance. That is, there's the, the odds of this being due to chance are highly unlikely. But of course, as scientists, we don't really have mechanisms to uh, explain through what kind of actions or means these things would take place. So to me, the, the interest in reporting all of this was to mention, well, look, these aren't that far-fetched ideas. They played big roles historically. Uh, many very serious people have sort of tried to address this. And people have actually tried to study and document these phenomena in actual experimental settings in sleep laboratories. Less so today, because that would sort of be the death of your career. Uh, already being a dream researcher, you know, this can be tricky business if you're a dream researcher bent on studying dream telepathy of all things, uh, then, you know, I don't think your chances of employment or promotion are, <laughs> are, very, are very good. Uh, but things are different back in the 60s. Yeah, for sure. Well, and as I understand the idea being, part of the idea being with that experiment, the Grateful Dead did that a larger like a body of people might somehow be more effective of in transmitting something. Yeah. Instead of one mind transmitting, you had 6,000 minds and a good proportion of them may be in altered states themselves. Yeah. So to me, the just the whole idea and the fact that so many people took place, took part in these experiments and that a band like the Grateful Dead would be willing to do that, to, it was just fascinating. Uh, yeah. It's an interesting uh, part of experimental research on dreams that few people are aware of today. Yeah. Well, and and I'm I'm often I want to say amazed. That might not be the right word, but struck by the history of science is the history of being wrong, right? Correct. So, yes. like, and that's the basis of the scientific method is that we, as I understand this, and you're the scientist here, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but. We really can't ever prove something as true. We can only disprove what's untrue, right? So we we take this theory, this hypothesis, and we test it, and we develop, and, and although we can never get perhaps absolute evidence, we can just maybe get less wrong. We can get more accurate, right? right? And, and so one of the things that's interesting to me about dreams in this regard is that we know there are these theories. There will always be a fringe. There will always be things that are beyond the scope of what is normal or understood or whatever. And, and so perhaps here in the work that you're doing or other sleep and dream researchers have done, you know, that was closer to the, to the periphery, closer to the edge, which is great because that's how we expand, you know, what's known and even what's knowable. 
what I'm interested in in this whole process is about then to bring it back, not just to the work that's being done in laboratories or you know clinics or whatever, but the things that that we each live or we have the opportunity to live and, and maybe understand or, or, or apply. And some of these specific examples that I want to ask you about, you know, because I have one of my own that I might ask you about, but um, you write in your book that more than one Nobel laureate has attributed their prize-winning discoveries to dreams that revealed to them how some piece of the world worked. So first of all, we've got multiple Nobel laureates yeah, at least who talk two, about At least this. two, yeah. So at, le- at least two. I think Salk, is Salk one of this? Uh, no. So one one is uh, Otto Louis on the uh, neural transmission, uh, how, how neurons uh, communicate with uh, one another. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, what's the, I thought this was in this book about who was the, the researcher. Okay. I'm going to set that aside. There, there was Mendeleev who discovered the periodic table of the elements. That's right. Where he, that was the one where he anticipated what would go where. Exactly. Yes. Even though he didn't know. Yes. Will you talk a little bit about, about his story? Uh, sure. But in, in his story, um, as in the others, and this is one thing we try to clarify in the book, it's important to keep in mind that, A, it's not just that these discoveries just occurred out of the blue uh, in their dreams. These people were immersed in trying to solving problems for months, uh, in Mendeleev's case, for years. So you are immersed daily. Your your life is sort of, you know, really becoming almost obsessive with these problems. And to the extent that we know that dreams try to embody or often embody your current concerns and have these creative aspects to them in terms of how things get presented, and that's the unusual or bizarre elements of dreams, it so happened that they had these dreams where solutions seem to present themselves, but the solutions aren't completely formed in the dreams. They end up making sense of it when thinking about the dream once awake. And so it's not that the dream just gave you, here's the periodic table of the elements, it's laid out this way. You know, one example, uh, for instance, of this is a chemist who discovered the uh, structure of the basic of organic chemistry, the benzene molecule. Now, he knew that there were probably uh, six atoms, carbon atoms in the benzene molecule, but what was unknown was how they were put together. And so if you think of six points, well, they could be linear, they could be in a form of a T, they could be sort of like this W, who knows, there's all these different ways you could put them together. And he had a dream where there was these six snakes sort of all moving about. And then each started biting the tail of the next. And so they formed a circle at the end. And when he woke up, then he went, oh, yes, the structure is not a linear one. It's not a wave one. It's a circular one. And so it's through thinking about maybe what the dream represented that they, they sort of made, came to the discovery or the solution to the problem. And so dreams don't really present these solutions in and of themselves, and they don't come out of the blue. They come out of these minds that have been immersed in these problems. And then when you have this, some of these dreams, you think about it, and the solution appears to you. Now, even though there's these famous examples, it also bears noting that most people don't come with mind, you know, world shattering discoveries that occurred in their dreams. And even the few that have done, if we think that most people have multiple dreams every night of their lives, and there are billions of us on this planet, and there's just a handful of these dreams that lead to these astounding discoveries. So it's something that can happen, but it's probably not the function to give us these all made solutions to our dreams, uh, to, to our to our problems while we are awake. Yeah. And there are these incredible events, which I know you're no stranger to. But again, my wife, just a week ago, less than a week ago, sent me an article that was published in CNN. I think on the, we're recording this in January of 2021. This was uh, on the 27th 
of this month, she sent me this article about this woman who won $60 million playing the lottery using numbers that had appeared in a dream her husband had had. Right. And I mean, on that, and let me just ask, I'll share my experience and then ask you because I think maybe there's commonality perhaps. You know, when I was about eight years old, I had a dream that I was riding my bike, very normal experience of the activities I was doing at the time. We rode down a street that was in my neighborhood. It was at the far edge of what was permitted for me to go. And in my dream, a dog came out of a driveway, bit my friend on the leg so bad he needed stitches. And the following day, it unfolded exactly as I dreamed it. And so this instance where this woman, you know, gets these lottery numbers from her husband and then in waking life plays those numbers, win $60 million or in my life where I have this dream about this dog biting my friend. And the next day it happens exactly as I dreamed it. How do you explain these? Is this precognition? Is this coincidence? Is it something else? What, how do you uh, understand or explain things like this? Okay. Well, first of all, I'll preface this by saying there are a multitude of these kinds of dream experiences that neither I or I think any other researcher can explain. Okay. That being said, there are many others that we can. So the uh, numbers that you're mentioning, you know, she played these numbers. Well, there are probably you know, thousands of people playing all kinds of numbers that they dreamt about. And if they don't win the lottery, do you hear about them? Of course not. No. Yeah. So there's a bias. So for instance, when there's a plane crash or a volcanic eruption, it's not unusual for me to receive several emails from people saying, oh, I dreamt of this plane crash or I dreamt of a volcanic eruption uh, last week and now look what's going on, you know, in Iceland or, you know, look at this, this plane crash. And so, but had they dreamt of a volcanic eruption and maybe, you know, somewhere, some, you know, someplace on this planet, you know, people are dreaming about that every night, right? Because there's billions of dreams generated and at least a few of them will be about this or that for a variety of reasons. And if after a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, there's no volcanic eruption, no one writes to me to say, wow, I have this dream of volcanic eruption, and guess what? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing has happened. And so we have these biases, which is also true in wakefulness, to see connections, but to disregard all the times that there are none. And so we can explain some of these dreams, or a good portion of them, in this way. And Others can be explained by things that our brain has registered, even though we have not consciously registered them. And so I give the example when I was in graduate school of uh, a neighbor of mine who on her steps outdoors leading to her apartment almost went through one of the steps gave way, wooden steps gave way under her weight and she almost had this really bad fall. And then knowing what I was studying in grad school told me, Tony, you know, you won't believe this, but I had a dream where I fell through the stairs just like a few days ago. And, you know, this morning when I was leaving to go to work, you know, it really happened. My foot went through one of the stairs and because she was my neighbor, I went over. But when I was looking at her steps, I noticed that there was some rot at the junctions of where the wood has, you know, is, is attached to the handrails and so on. And so I think her brain probably registered this rot because when I pointed it out to her, she goes, I never really noticed. And, and I believe her, but her brain probably registered. And if there's rot on these steps uh, or maybe even squeaking sounds that you don't, you've gotten used to over the months or years, or you don't notice they're getting worse progressively, but your brain does. And if it's trying to show you what might happen in the future, well, what might happen if your steps are, you know, not as in good condition as you are, you're going to pass through them. And so some of these can be explained by the fact that your brain registers things uh, that you don't consciously are aware of. And then finally, however, we get to the examples like the one you told me about, about when you were eight and riding your bicycle and having the exact same sequence replay. And I have honestly no good explanation for that. And now people have offered some uh, saying that, well, the 
you reconstructed the dream as the, you know, a bit like deja vu, you know, and so there's a delay and people sort of think that they dreamt about it, but it's really a, another kind of brain mechanism at work. And, you know, that might make sense for some, not for others. However, we do know that you can uh, stimulate areas of the brain and create these sentiments of deja vu. And you can also reactivate experiences of what we believe are past dreams that you've had. And so maybe there is something uh, to it. But, you know, earlier on, you mentioned that, you know, there's many things that science still does not know, or that we think we know, but then we later figure out we are wrong. Uh, and this might be one of those fears where our understanding of the world we live in isn't complete enough for the brain that we have and what it's capable of doing to really account for these experiences. And that's also why in the book, uh, we mention a few examples of concepts that when they were put forth, like electricity, people thought that people were nuts. Like electricity cannot be a thing. Like you cannot have these electrons, you know, moving about and so on. And But now, you know, we all just plug in our iPhones and turn on lights and we take this for granted and we manipulate it well. But when the concept or the idea came forth, you know, people were, were ridiculed. And there's many examples like that, you know, our understanding of genetics and so on. And so maybe, you know, in 30, 40, 100 years, I don't know, people will go, wow, it's, it's amazing. People never caught on that, you know, the sleeping brain could do this or that this happened or that these kinds of waves exist. And, and, and we do know through real science and yeah, um, when we look at cosmology, when we look at the infinite uh, quantum mechanics, you know, the world is a really bizarre place from an empirical scientific perspective. And maybe there's things in there uh, that have, we have yet to really well understand. And dreams might be somehow tied into all this. No doubt. No doubt. Well, maybe this is the perfect place to, to pivot to your, to your next up model. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about what, why you call it next up and what it, what it tells us about dreams. Well, next up stands for network explorations to understand possibilities. And in essence, what we believe is going on in the dreaming brain is the dreaming brain looks at what have you recently, first of all, I'll take a step back. We, you know, sleep itself is, is quite a conundrum as to why evolution would come up with something that puts us in such great danger. When you are asleep, you can be attacked, you can be dragged away by an animal, you can, I mean, you, you are literally cut off from the external world. Why the, you know, yeah. H would you want to do that? <laughs> right? Yeah. And by the way, on that point, this was something I learned from you that in your book about the animals, I think it, I, sharks, dolphins, certain birds yes. that do the hemispheric yes, sleep? Yes, correct. Uh, so for instance, in uh, dolphins, they have what is called unihemispheric sleep. So it's half of the brain sleeps at a time. That's amazing. And, and the reason uh, for that is quite simple. Otherwise, they would drown. Dolphins need to surface to breathe. If they are asleep, they won't swim. They will sink and they will drown. And so sleep must be really important for evolution to come up with these really convoluted ways to make sleep happen. So if you think that, you know, half your brain is, is asleep and the other one, so you can keep swimming. We also know that migratory birds seem to have the same pattern. So they're flying for, you know, days on end over oceans, no places to land. And they too now, we know, also show evidence of this unihemispheric sleep. So, you know, there must be something driving this. And in sleep, it's not just that we're closing our eyes and relaxing. People say, oh, it's to conserve energy. Well, you can just close your eyes, you know, bundle up somewhere and not do much and conserve energy. No, you're really shutting yourself out from the external world. And so we think that for every, at least in humans, every two hours you spend awake, uh, your brain needs to shut off for an hour to go offline and to process all of this and make sense of our experiences. And so when it's building our knowledge base, memories, where do we store this 
conversation that we had today? Where do I store or what do I relate to, you know, this relationship that I'm having or these emotions that I'm living with? So all of our daytime activities, we, we need to sort of integrate them in these larger neural networks. And now there's evidence that sleep plays an important role in this, in memories, how our memories are created, how they are uh, added to existing uh, knowledge that we have, semantic knowledge about the world, even procedural knowledge, how you, if you're learning to play uh, the piano or uh, riding a bicycle or the guitar or downhill skiing, sleep can play a role in improving these kinds of skills. So to get back to uh, dreaming itself, we think that dreaming is a really privileged way that your brain has to try to make sense of this. And so what it does is that it embodies our ongoing uh, concerns, and there's very good evidence. And sometimes it does it metaphorically. Dreams rarely show what's known as episodic memories, memories for events as they happened. And so dreams don't portray events, they tell stories about them. And so if you are worried about a talk you need to give tomorrow or whatever, well, your brain's not going to just, you know, show you being, you know, oh, I'm worried about my talk tomorrow. Maybe you'll be in front of an audience and uh, you'll be naked. Maybe your teeth will be crumbling out. Why? Because your concern, is, it's a great embodiment of that feeling of how am I perceived? Am I up to the task? And so these metaphors about driving a vehicle out of control, there's different ways that your brain, much like in works of art and fiction, movies, you know, there's these themes that are used to sort of teach us about the world. And so the dreaming brain is doing something very similar to that. It takes our experiences and then it looks for weakly associated memories. Why weekly? Well, when you're awake, you have no problem thinking about strongly related memories. You know, oh, this argument with my girlfriend makes me think of what my mom used to say and whatever. So it's easy to sort of build that, that knowledge up. But in sleep and while you're dreaming, your brain can look at these really associated networks, but they're weakly associated. And that's what gives dreams, or one of the reasons it gives dreams, their sort of unusual or bizarre flavor. But the reason we need to experience dreams is that your brain can monitor how you react to the dream content. And not only that, it can also monitor how your thoughts and actions influence the dream. And so there's this always this dynamic interplay between you experiencing the dream, but also how the dream reacts, including the people, to what you say, what you think, and what you do. And then if you react strongly, the brain probably calculates, oh, this is a useful exploration I did in my links, and it strengthens that. And then later on, when you experience something similar, these neural pathways will be activated and hopefully you will be better prepared to deal with these circumstances. And so your dreaming brain, in essence, is trying to learn from what you experienced during the day, see to how it relates to similar things you've experienced in the past to better prepare you for an uncertain future. And all this, however, is done online while you are dreaming. Whether you remember your dreams or not really probably does not play a role in this process. Now, if you remember your dreams and are so inclined to want to use them, write them down, uh, use them for self-exploration, that's fantastic. And that's all an added bonus. And the reason we think these are just added bonuses but not the actual function of dreams is because we have many people who never remember their dreams. And so what dreaming has no function for them, even though they do it every night of their lives, uh, we spend every night about an hour and a half or more immersed in REM sleep. So about six years uh, of our lifetime, of which we'll remember infinitesimally small proportion. And so if we had to remember them, it would be a colossal waste of time or inefficient process. 
The other thing is that you mentioned your wife uh, told you a dream this morning, but sometimes we remember a dream later on in the day. We see something, we see a cat, a car go by or a conversation go, oh yeah, last night I dreamt about that. So what's your dream now acquires a function like six, seven hours after it occurred because you just remember it and you just remember a little fraction. So just that fraction has a function. Now it makes much more sense to think whatever your brain is doing while it's happening, that's what counts. Now, if you remember your dreams and you want to explore them, you use them for creativity or you use them to share with others, as you mentioned earlier on with other uh, societies, those are all really useful things. Uh, And so they are a way that the human can creatively use these things, like we make tools and so on, uh, to better our lives or to increase our chances of survival or social understanding, what have you. And so there's the biological function of dreams, and then there are the uses we can make of them if we are so inclined and interested which I think too few people are, unfortunately. I think so too. So if I understand this next up, the network exploration to understand possibilities, as you're saying, you know, that to a large degree, this is, you didn't use this word, I don't think, but it's unconscious. We're not aware of it, right? So there's this idea that just because we don't remember it, just because it's not in our waking, like our conscious awareness upon waking, that's actually that's no suggestion. There's no evidence or no reason to believe that that means it's like, it's not valuable. Instead, there, there is a benefit. I mean, we, I guess we come from this position as scientists. And and again, you can correct me, but the idea that, you know, nature, nature is parsimonious. Nature is efficient. Nature, there's a purpose to what it does or so it seems that's the comfort, Right, right? So, so coming from that place saying there is some benefit or, biological or evolutionary advantage to the fact that this even occurs. And now we're just trying to understand, well, what is that? And as you're saying, this network exploration, as I understand from the book that it's in REM sleep, that that network, the network being the memories, the experiences from our life. And now those, that network, we're able to search things from our childhood, things that we weren't aware of at the moment, like maybe conversations we overheard, you know, entertainment or media that we consumed even years ago that we're searching that network for these connections, these weak connections in this way that upon waking, we might not have been aware of, but it's still doing something often below the level of conscious awareness that's helping us to survive and maybe to thrive, but at least to survive. Yes. Do do I have that? Oh, that was great. I wish I was recording you. (laughs) (laughs) No, that, that was, that, that's really the essence of it. Yes, absolutely. So this is, this is something I'm as a coach that I'm always fascinated by, which is how much of human behavior really does come down to these biological urges to survive and reproduce. (laughs) Is it really as simple as move away from the pain and the danger, you know, survive and then, and then reproduce. And using that worldview, which it makes, it explains so much that your theory seems in line with that. And it's something I'd never heard before. How is it being received? I mean, this is, I haven't done the kind of research you've done, but I haven't heard this before. How are other people in the scientific and academic community responding to this? Well, this is, first of all, I should say fairly new. So it's a little early to tell, but I think it's innovative in many ways. Here we, we've discussed sort of the, the core principle of Next Step, but Next Step has many unique features. So uh, it describes also at the earlier, at the outset, we started discussing different forms dreams have, you know, what counts as a dream. And so sometimes we have these images that can play in front of our eyes as we are falling asleep, things known as hypnagogic images. We know that dreams in other non-REM stages of sleep, like in N2, tend to have stronger associations to our waking concerns uh, and tend to be more thought-like, less emotional, and less narratively driven. And next up sort of doesn't thinks that dreams serve complementary but somewhat different functions depending on their underlying uh, sleep stage. And that is something new. It also allows uh, to think about dreams or dream-related processes in newborn babies, 
you know, because, you know, some models about all dreams are, you know, unfulfilled wishes, whatever. Well, I don't know what a three day old baby uh, wishes for because their mind is just so it, it makes more sense with respect to the whole lifespan of humans, even in other animals. So I think that so far the comments we've had are quite positive. But then, you know, like many things in science, hopefully actually we got a few things wrong, which will help us get them right as we move uh, forth. But before, when you were mentioning that much of this process is unconscious, I think uh, to me, anyways, I've always had a particular fascination with dream characters. So the people that we meet in our dreams, uh, because they too are created by our brains, but they are often surprising in how they interact with us. Sometimes they're off the things they have to say. And even in what we be what we call lucid dreams, dreams in which you are aware that you are dreaming. So you are conscious in the dream. Elements of the dream still escape your consciousness, even though all of this is being generated by the one brain, by you, Yeah. right? Yeah. And so I can have a lucid dream and make a dream character, say, appear, right? And I go, oh, wow, you know, I've always wanted to talk to so-and-so. And here they are, you know, I'm going to open this door. And when I open the door, they're going to be there and open the door and they're there. And then I can ask them a question. But why are they going to answer to my question? I have no idea. Right. But their words are going to be created by my brain. Yet I have no idea what they're about to say. Right. Whether they're going to be pleased by my question or disgruntled or think I'm an idiot. Right? All of those things can happen. And yet, so your brain is creating all of this, but it's keeping information away from you, right? You don't know what these characters are going to do. And there's also lots of things that go on in dreams of, over which we have little control. So you can become aware that you're dreaming and going, oh, wow, I'd love to be in Paris right now in an outdoor cafe. And then you close your eyes in the dream, you imagine the scene, and there you are. Good. So you're able to control that element. Who else is around you? Is it sunny? Is it dark? Uh, is there traffic? Is it warm? What clothes are you wearing? Now, you can pay attention to all of these things and realize, oh, I have my jeans on. Or, wow, look at these shoes. Or, look at those people. But you didn't think about all of this. Your brain created all of this. So there's even in these lucid dreams, you still have, if you want to call it unconscious, you still have all of these other processes going on. And we think that's a, a key part of dreaming. And to me, a fascinating one. Again, because, you know, when a dream character says or does uh, something that surprises you in your dream, you are in a very real way surprising yourself. Yeah. It's so fascinating. And these often seem to have also, you know, their own emotions. Like, you know, the you could dream of your ex and she's crying and she's upset or someone who's caught you cheating and she's really angry or an angry boss or a person you haven't seen in years and they're so happy to see you again. So they seem to have their own emotions, their own thoughts, their own intentions, but they're being created by you. And yet you're not really able to sort of intuit what they are thinking, what they're Doing. And of course, yes, yeah, some characters seem like extras in movies, right? They're two-dimensional and whatever, but others really have these compelling features. And to me, these dream characters are one of the most fascinating aspects of dreams. I mentioned at the outset this lucid dream that I had when I was in college, which literally changed my life because it's from that dream that I started reading about it and decided I wanted to study dreams. But in that dream, I actually met a dream character who tried to convince me that it was not a dream. And he even went as far as to tell me, look, I also sleep at night. I also have dreams. I'm not telling you that you are not real, right? And so to me, this was mind-blowing. On top of these other things, like at one point in the dream, I picked up some snow and I could feel the coldness of the snow in my hand. And I'm thinking, wow, but... I'm in my bed sleeping right now, right? 
how can I feel this coldness? My real hand is, you know, maybe under my pillow or whatever. And at one point also, I let out this huge scream because I wanted to hear myself yell, knowing that I'm silently asleep. And I'm going, how can I create this, this strong vocalization that, that I really hear? And I remember some characters in my dream also turning around going, you know, what's this idiot yelling about, you know? And even at times I go, it's better be a dream, right? And so there's, yes, this duality between even when you are aware that you're dreaming about what's possible, what's going on in your dream while all this is taking place, while you are quietly asleep in bed is um, still something that fascinates me to this day. Yeah, it is amazing in, in this whole topic of lucid dreaming. Is it something anyone can learn to do? And maybe if it's useful, maybe you can speak about how your practice related to lucid dreaming has has evolved and what it's like today. It definitely is a learnable skill. Honestly, I would say it's tougher to learn than many people make it out to be. People who write books about it or give workshops or what have you. That said, yes. And there's steps people can do. The one of the first ones to keep a dream journal. So you're becoming, you become more intimately aware of and knowledgeable about your own dreams. So, you know, where do they tend to take place? What are the settings? Who are the characters? And so on. Then the thing with dreams is that we all often only realize how odd or bizarre they are once we awaken. When we are in them, we believe them to be real, no matter how unusual, you know, you go, oh my gosh, I have a twin brother. I didn't know. Oh, hi, John. How are you doing? You know, we're not like, what? What do you mean a twin brother this can't be? No, we kind of go with the flow and so on. And so one method is to develop more critical thinking while you are awake. So to sort of try every time you see something unusual or you have strong emotions, to take a moment and ask yourself, am I dreaming? Even though you're fully aware that you're awake, it's just to get into the habit of doing it. But to really do it, think about how did I get here? What was I doing right before this happened? Take a look at your clothes. Do they make sense? And so the idea is that hopefully this kind of critical thinking can sort of be transferred to your dream so that when you do have something unusual or strong emotion and you go, how did I get here? Oh, you don't remember taking the bus or driving or whatever. You're just, you're at your workplace. You don't remember what you have for breakfast or you look at your clothes and you're going, it's not my clothes or it's the wrong season. Or So there's different things you can do. You can also, for instance, write a letter uh, on the palm of your hand or the back of your hand. Let's say D for dream. And anytime you see it, uh, you're supposed to ask yourself, am I dreaming? Right. Or as, as someone asks you, what's that D about? You know, am I dreaming? But again, you got to do it carefully and really attentively or else in the dream, maybe you'll dream about your D and a dream character will say, what's that about? It goes, oh, because I'm doing this experiment for dreams. And, and then you'll just go on about your day. So there's things of, of that nature you can do. And then there's much more uh, complicated cognitive activities that people can engage in, including playing with their with their sleep itself that can favor lucid dreaming. But becoming lucid in the dream is relatively the easy part. Staying lucid is the tough one. It's really easy to get distracted and to forget that one is dreaming or to get overly excited because you're having this great flying dream, whatever, and then you wake up. So strong emotions, just like in nightmares, can wake you up. Uh, Really strong positive ones can wake you up. But if you're too laid back, then you can relapse into non-lucid dreaming. And at times also your logic is off, even you, though you think you're really clever in the dream. So uh, again, when I was in grad school, once I dreamt, and I was writing my thesis, I dreamt of Carl Jung. And I became aware that I was dreaming. And I thought, wow, you know, I'm dreaming of Carl Jung. And he's telling me all these wonderful ideas, it seemed to me, uh, LSD-like, they were really profound and and so on. He even had these schemas that he was drawing out about how the mind worked. And my fear in the dream was, I'm not going to remember all of this when I wake up. It's too complicated. So I started taking notes. I thought I was being really clever, right? Till I woke up and well, my notes were not there, right? Because I was taking notes in the dream. Uh, Uh, So sometimes you have, you know, you think you're being clever and you're logical, but you're really not. And so all of that takes a while to sort of try to get your head around and sort of to master. Like many waking 
uh, states, whether it's like meditation or mindfulness. It's not just because, you know, you're able for three seconds to sort of have a, a feeling of peacefulness that you've achieved your goal. And so you got to keep working at it. Uh, and then like many other learnable skills, some people learn uh, much faster than others. And then there's actual applications for things like lucid dreaming to treat nightmares, for instance, or for creativity, just for entertainment. There's a lot of things. But like I said, it's usually more hard work than uh, people make it out to be. And then many even proficient lucid dreamers, uh, and I don't consider myself a proficient lucid dreamer. I consider myself an occasional one. But sometimes it's fun not to try to change anything, to just explore the dream as it unfolds naturally around you. And so I'm walking down the street. I realize that I'm dreaming and I'll just keep on walking, going, what is my brain going to you know, present to me uh, next? And instead of telling many novice lucid dreamers, we'll tell a dream character, oh, you're not real. You're part of my dream. And then the characters might get upset. But a much more instructive and potentially insightful approach is to ask these characters, who are you? Who am I? What is the most important thing I should know about you? Or tell me more about what awaits us. And sometimes, you know, the replies can be you know, pure gibberish, but sometimes they're quite insightful and, you know, in many ways profound. And they remain profound, unlike the, when I flush the toilet, everything goes down. When you wake up, you think about the answer. And again, it's that interplay between yourself and your sleeping brain, your mind, that is interacting. You know, when you're asking this to the dream character, you're really asking it to part of yourself. So it's interesting to know, what did I answer to my question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one of the books you mention in your book in the suggested reading section is this, I know it's a, a popular book on lucid dreaming. People listening, if they don't already know about, might enjoy Lucid Dreaming. So the title is Lucid Dreaming, Exploring the World of Lucid Dreaming by Stephen LeBurge. Yes. Yeah. And, and Stephen uh, was one of the first people to uh, show that lucid dreaming was a real kind of dream that happens in sleep as part of his thesis at Stanford University, showing that people, this is quite mind boggling, but true. And now it's been done in dozens of labs, but people can communicate with researchers from inside their dream by means of these eye movements that get detected in the laboratory. So in a dream, under your, you know, in the dream, if you go move your eyes left, right, left, right, extreme motions, the eyes in your body, asleep in the lab, under closed eyelids, will also move left, right, left, right. And these signals stand out. And so lucid dreamers, we know, can signal when they become aware they're dreaming, and then they can signal again uh, when they begin a task that experimenters have asked them to do. Do 10 squats, count to 10, uh, sing. And then when they're done the task, they can signal again. And so the researchers know that between signal uh, two and three, for instance, a person was singing or counting or doing some kind of activity. Then you can look, what was going on in the brain or in terms of heart rate or respiration rate when the person was doing that very same activity. So uh, yeah, that's a very good book. And there, there are many others on lucid dreaming. And of course, then there's things like the movie of Inception and all kinds of fictional works as well. Yeah. When you were talking about writing a letter D, I was thinking of, or take a top, <laughs> take a top <laughs> with you. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, well, let me go ahead and transition our conversation, if that's okay with you, to what I call the enlightening lightning round, a, okay. a series of questions on a variety of topics. My aim is to, for the most part, to ask the question and just be quiet, but you're welcome to answer as long as you want. I might tug on a few of your responses a little bit, but I'll aim to keep us moving through this efficiently. Okay. Question number one, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a... A very complicated dream. <laughs> How did I know you were going to say that? <laughs> okay, question number two. Here I'm borrowing Peter Thiel's question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? Uh, dreams are important. Okay, question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life 
to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a saying or a phrase or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? Live in love. All right. Question number four, what book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often? Probably Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Robert Persig. Why that book? Correct. It's a book that just captured my fancy the first time I, I read it. Uh, now, I, I should also add that, uh, and I had read it multiple times, and when I reread it a few years ago, I must admit that I failed to understand why I was so taken by it you know, 20 years ago or so, or at least for the second half. But at the time, I just thought it was an interesting uh, meditative you know, treaties on different ways we can uh, experience and think of the world around us in, in this fictionalized story. And there's a line in there that I, to this day, really like. And it is, sometimes it's better to travel than to arrive, which is, you know, enjoy the journey and stop thinking about where you, you know, when, are we there yet? Yeah. <laughs> you know, enjoy the journey. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of journeying or traveling, uh, question number five is that you've traveled a lot in your life. What's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? Well, I'm an avid backpacker. I love backpacking in mountains and deserts. And uh, I would say my headlamp because I love exploring my surroundings at nighttime. Of course, I'll do it by moonlight if I can, which is ideal. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Question number six. What have you started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? What's one thing? I stopped smoking. Probably the most stupid thing I ever started doing in my life. And I've done a few. And I started smoking as a full-grown adult. So... I have no excuse that, you know, it was peer pressure. I was a teenager, you know, I was in, I was well into my early twenties when I started. So actually at a dream conference of all places. Is when you started. It didn't, yes. Wow. Interesting. But you've stopped now and. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. It, it didn't last that long, but you know, there's some kind of habits that, you know, any length of time is too long. As long as you learn from it and. and okay. Question number seven, recognizing that you, you live in Montreal. Montreal. I'm not sure I say that yeah. <laughs> as you might, but what's one thing you wish every American knew? We don't all say, Hey, <laughs> yeah. And we don't live in igloos. Okay. Question number eight. What's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? Listen to the other person and be patient. Okay. And question number nine, uh, aside from compound interest, What's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money or what's something you're always sure to do with it or you never do with it? Don't waste it. Yeah. And then the, the other part I think is the difficult at times balancing act between enjoying your life now and planning for the future. And that's true beyond just finances, but uh, it ties into that. Yeah. All the way back to your response to the first question of what's life about. <laughs> yes, Correct. <laughs> You're very congruent. <laughs> okay. So speaking of money, one thing I have done uh, to express my gratitude to you for sharing so generously of your time and your experience and your expertise is I've gone to the micro lending site, Kiva.org. I've made a hundred dollar micro loan to an entrepreneur in Ghana, a woman named Salome, who's 45 years old. She's got three children and she sells sewing accessories where she lives. And in this way, she'll use this money to improve the quality of life for herself, her family, and her community. So thank you for giving me a reason to, to do that. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. Let's go ahead then. And coming down the stretch on the interview is just these questions about writing, the creative process. I might ask a few about marketing and promotion. You seem to have done an extraordinarily good job getting the word out about Win Brain's Dream. Some good coverage on, in uh, looks like the Washington Post and NPR and things like this. But before we, before we get to that, let me ask about this writing. You, your writing spans a pretty wide range from academic papers and journal articles, so very scholarly work, to things that are more popular, things we talked about 
in this interview, things like the why dreaming is like taking LSD, to this book, uh, When Brains Dream, is for a more popular audience, and even novels. So right. when did you, let me start by asking, when did you first know you were a writer? <laughs> uh, that's a tough one. I don't know. I don't even know if I if I know that for a fact today, that is, you know, on the one hand, I want to say, oh, I wrote this intro to what would have been a novel back when I was in high school, I think in grade seven or eight. And I remember the title called The Robinson Cave, where these three friends who get lost inside this endless cave and so on. So I could say that. On the other hand, when I read novels from others, so I'm reading, uh, right now for instance well shortly uh not that long ago i finished reading uh iq 84 i'm you know cloud atlas the bone clocks that i'm reading right now anyway so there's these works that i read and i'm in awe with the uh, the storytelling the depths of the characters uh the beauty of certain passages and i that seems so distant from my skills that seem so rudimentary and limited um, that then my, you know, as much as I would say, oh, I discovered I was a writer, you know, in, in high school, I could say I'm not a writer. You know, I do my best to sort of create stories that might interest some people. Now, scientific writing, uh, definitely, I think I'm very good at that, or maybe even popular writing to try to, uh, as we did in this book, trying to get complex ideas and findings in putting them, explain them in a way that are easily accessible. But fiction is a whole other ball game and infinitely more difficult than the best scientific writing. Scientific writing, you know the rules and their structures to follow. And so it's becoming familiar with that. Fiction is a whole other world. And, and even when you think you are doing well, I'm speaking for myself, but then you reread things that you wrote a few weeks later, months later, and you cringe. And so you realize, you know, that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, that said, uh, like for fiction writing is probably one of the things that I find the most amazing, creative, it's addictive. I love the liberty of exploring ideas, of creating worlds, and much of that world building for me is built around dreams but without the limits of science and this so you can really open up but again yeah to answer your question scientific writer sure a writer at large mm, uh, you know i'll let others decide what's your process is there a commonality to to a piece of writing whether it's again a scientific paper whether it's a book you know like like when brains dream whether it's a novel What's common to the way that you approach the the piece or the project? I think the commonality is just getting really immersed in it. And so I like to the extent possible where life allows this to sort of not disappear, but to enter these bubbles. And I get really immersed and absorbed, but like 24 uh, seven, that's really what I'm thinking about when I think about as when I'm in my car going somewhere, as I'm falling asleep, when I wake up. And so I will try to stay immersed in these bubbles where I'm sort of trying to get things right, in, whether it's plot ideas, whether it's how to explain concepts like for in when brains dream. I would say science writing, you can sort of more easily slip in and out of it because you're working on an intro or the methods or, you know, the discussion sections. And that, that's more... I wouldn't say a formula, but each part is sort of independent. And once you've written, you know, 20, 30 articles, you sort of you sort of get used to uh, the process. But for something like One Brain Stream or um, a novel, like I have one called uh, The Dream Keepers, that's quite more challenging and difficult because it's it's a much more a bigger project and it's you are focusing yes on what you are writing now but also how does it fit in in this much bigger whole and you, you sort of got to keep in mind you know like in a novel where is this leading to and and it's and yeah it, it it's just a lot more challenging and so again for me if you ask what they have in common is really getting uh, completely 
absorbed by the process. So if I can, I, I love going to a cottage or wherever for a week. And that's all I do is, is write. I'm so glad you shared that because I, w- I want to ask about when you're involved in a project and you talked about getting very immersed, how, you know, obviously the world doesn't stop. Your other responsibilities don't end, right? Okay. Just because you have this, this project or you're engaged in something. And, and so this is part of the answer to this question about how do you structure your time in order to bring a project to conclusion, even if you booked a week, you know, in a cottage probably don't finish the whole thing in a week. How do you, how do you persist? Like, how do you organize your schedule through time to be able to actually complete a work like this? A, I try to have, um, I try not to set firm expectations and deadlines because I've just learned that, you know, all kinds of stuff happens, you know, in the writing process, but outside of it. And, you know, you need to be uh, ready and willing to uh, address that. And so I try to just, you know, prioritize things and or to look ahead. Okay, in the month that comes, this, this, and this needs to be done. I'll also admit that I think that in the past, I've been guilty of maybe forgetting, you know, you mentioned, you know, the world continues, but sort of forgetting things in the outside world or not paying enough attention to them as they should. And so I'm much more mindful of that now that, you know, uh, yes, this bubble is fine, but you have family, you have friends, you have other responsibilities, and it can't come to the exclusion of all of this, even though maybe part of you really wants it, you know, because you just want to stay focused. And and it's really sometimes you're in the zone and you just don't want to leave the zone. But on the other hand, now I'm also become with time more confident that can re-enter that zone more easily. So I'm less, I wouldn't say superstitious, but worried about, oh, now I got, you know, I, everything's sort of clicking and I, and I have this momentum and creativity and afraid that if I stop, it'll like, you won't catch it again. And now I know, no, you can, you know, it might take a little while, but you'll get back uh, in it again. And, and again, the about finishing the project. I always want to finish the project. So I remember when I took my first creative writing classes and so on, uh, one thing uh, one of my uh, mentors had mentioned was, you know, if you're going to start a book, finish it. And so that was the goal. And But how long it takes and so on, that's really secondary. And it comes back, it makes me think of that line from the Robert Persig book, you know, uh, sometimes it's better to travel than to arrive. And, and and actually, sometimes when these projects end, part of me is kind of sad. And yes, now it goes out into the world and whatever. Um, but the process is, is also really enjoyable. Yeah. What have you learned about writing that has served you well that you would offer as advice or encouragement to others who are either in the middle of their own creative project or they're, they're harboring the desire <laughs> to, to complete one? I don't really think that I have good, useful advice to give people, honestly, because I think that the advice will work well for some and not work well for others. And it sort of depends on what you are working on, what your temperament is like, uh, what the rest of your life is like, what life circumstances allow you to do or not. But again, I will reiterate enjoy the process. If you're not enjoying the process, and it's not that it's not hard work, it's very hard work and it's frustrating work and it's, but there's still an enjoyment that you can glean from this, no matter how hard things are, uh, because it allows you to sort of confront with your own limitations, your frustrations. um, And that helps you also really savor more the other days where things really move ahead well. And so for, yeah, there's days where things, you know, you spent all day working on X and at the end you're going to scrap it all. And that's that's par for the course. So you got to sort of take a step back also, I think, and, and keep in mind the uh, bigger picture. With your book, The Dream Keepers, this, this novel, it's, uh, I understand it's a mystery thriller. Yeah. It was just published last year in 2020. You see yourself continuing this, oh, abs- this fiction absolutely. writing yes that's awesome what's this been like in your because you mentioned that it's different like writing novels writing fiction is ve- is very different i'm wondering if if you just want to speak any more about it what it's like how it's different 
what you love about it, what's challenging, anything, anything related to this. What I like about it is the same thing that makes it so hard is that anything goes, you know, it's, it's, who do you want to build us? It's world building and, you know, the sky's literally the limit and that's fun and it's also daunting. And so, but again, for me, the, the pleasure also comes about, I'm writing about something that I'm passionate about and it's dreams. Except here, it's more taking this liberty of exploring myths about dreams and these ideas that I know that science, the scientist tells me, you know, it's impossible. And so, like, I play with this idea that what if some characters in our dreams were real, right? Not just that it's our impression that they have their own intentions and feelings, but what if, you know, when you wake up, they they continue to exist in these other realms, which ties into a lot of myths about dreams. And, you know, earlier on, you were mentioning uh, some of your undoubtedly absolutely fascinating experience visiting some of these more traditional societies who value their dreams. And so it's more getting closer to these conceptions of dreams as real external worlds and what is possible in them. And are they possible to manipulate? And could that be used against us? And so I love these ideas and they, and they really take or they take me uh really elsewhere yeah that's awesome and then you're able to take readers on those journeys as well i hope so that's, yeah that's fun well good okay well i know i mentioned briefly about just publicity and, and getting the word out because it's one thing to finish writing a book it's a significant accomplishment in its own right to be sure but it's another then to to communicate that to people in a way that they understand and that they care about. What have you learned in the course of marketing or promoting a book that has uh, been interesting or useful to you? That it's really, really hard. And ultimately, I think it's out of your hands. I think that when things work well, a lot of it is through word of mouth. I mean, at the end, it's the... Uh, it's the same with movies, whatever, you know, the, you can show us trailers and this and pique our attention. But at the end, you know, if people really enjoy the, the movie experience or the theater uh, the, the, that they went to see, uh, they'll tell others and uh, that whom they think might also enjoy it. It's like gifting books, you gift books that you enjoyed. You think this person might really enjoy this, uh, but you might not give it to person, the other person, because you go, oh, no, they, they won't enjoy this stuff, but you might give them something else. And so I think that ultimately these things have a life on their own. But the challenge is in getting it out there to a sufficient number of people so that at least you can start this grass movement going. And, and you know, if no one knows about it, then no one can share it. And so that's uh, that can be really challenging, and I would say also demoralizing, because many people, you know, there, there's history is filled with examples of books that had or movies even, you know, great successes, but you know, after the authors died. Yeah, for sure. You know, like, like when it came out, you know, H.P. Lovecraft, a lot of great stuff, are like great for some, and a lot of it dream themed, you know, uh, but very little success or acknowledgement when. Uh, this stuff was actually coming out. And there's just many examples like this. And so sometimes it takes time or the worth or the excitement of the ideas to sort of be known. And sometimes they are never known. Yeah, that's right. I look at that and I choose to uh, find comfort <laughs> in this idea that, you know, the external view of our work has very little bearing on its true value and whether yes. it's recognized in our lifetime or or not, you know, in some ways, in a large way, that's not up to us, but to do the work, like you're saying, to journey is often better than to arrive. So, yeah, there's something about that. And even in the writing, for instance, you know, I mentioned early on how supportive my mom has always been. And and so even when writing this work of fiction, every time I'd have a chapter that I thought was close to being polished and so on, I would send it to her. And so she became sort of my reader. And so it's just one person, but I know it, it brought her joy. And of course she's biased. She's my mom, you know, but uh, other beta readers as well. And so, so you might not have, you know, a large uh, number of people interested or who eventually will know, but at least you have a few who, you know, when, when a few people write back and say, I really enjoyed this, this, you know, or it affected my dreams or this is really cool idea. Then it's, you know, it's sort of, 
it's comforting because you know that at least a few people you gave them a couple of hours of enjoyment. But of course, you you want that to be as widespread as possible, and that's sort of the motivation to continue. But I I, I honestly thoroughly enjoy the process itself and um, not knowing what awaits afterwards. And that's why, again, we're back to the enjoying the journey and not the end point. Yeah, it's a theme of the interview for Which sure. It's often disappointing, <laughs> especially, when, no, especially when the journey yeah. is so long and you dream about the end point. And if that's your focus, sometimes when you get there, it's kind of like, hmm. It's a letdown. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and there's absolutely. no going back. That's right. It's just then a new destination that we pick yes. a new a new point. Okay, so two last questions. Uh, one is, do you have any questions you ask of readers, like those beta readers that you're talking about? And I'm reminded of this because a previous guest, he will always ask readers three questions with any piece he's drafting. He'll ask, is it confusing? Is it boring? And is it arrogant? Like those are his questions, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. But do you have any similar questions or feedback that you're seeking when you invite someone to read something you've written? And at an early stage? Uh, arrogant, definitely not. I think the confusion part, because you are so familiar with the plot, your ideas and so on, but that this evolves over time, you might have taken out or changed something in the book and forgot to replace it with something or that piece of information was really key to understand something else later. I had, I remember one beta reader say, you know, why did so-and-so do this at this point? And I went, well, because of this. And they went, well, when was when did you tell us that? Oh, yeah. And then I realized <laughs> I didn't. I just it's just my my understanding of the character, but I never made it explicit. And so there's things like that. You become so in tuned or imbibed or familiar with the characters and their intentions that sometimes you might forget to make them explicit to the reader. Or sometimes also you might put things there because you think they're useful. Uh, to understand something else later in the book, but your thoughts have changed along the way. And so this ends up being a loose end. So I think it's more the coherence in the story. So I, th I think it's useful for that. And at the end, it's really to know, you know, was this enjoyable, right? Did you enjoy, you know, whatever time you spent going on this imaginary ride? And if it's yes, and it keeps you in there, or sometimes people saying, this is really good, but then this passage sort of took me out of the out of the book, out of the imaginative process, because it made me think of a real life circumstance or whatever you're going on. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, things of that nature. Yeah. Awesome. And okay. And then final question is just what thoughts you leave listeners with anything. I know that's a big, broad question, but anything from your work, what you've learned, your life experience, anything about writing, the two hours we've just spent talking, is there kind of a thought that stands out to you, something that maybe feels appropriate to, to share or leave those listening with it at this moment? Sleep is very important. Don't skip on your sleep. If you're a good sleeper, don't you know enjoy it, but value it. Don't be afraid to value your dreams or to pay attention to them uh, in whatever form feels right for you. As for the uh, writing, I, mean, I, I I love books. You know, books are wonderful. So whether they are uh, nonfiction, so you learn about things about yourself, the world you live in, things that are of interest to you, be it botany or whatever, astronomy, whatever you. And of course, you know, works of fiction are they're works of art. And so, like artworks, being a sculpture, a painting, uh, architecture they can be appreciated in different ways. And so I, I, I think that's a, a particularly really almost profound uh, gift of the human mind to not just be able to create these worlds uh, or these works, uh, but then to be able to sort of to have someone else enter them and enjoy them. And uh, even though people will enjoy them in different ways. And incidentally, I would say that those, we can view dreams in the same way. I just want to mention, I, I think dreams are psychologically meaningful, certainly, which is why I, I like studying them. But I don't think each dream holds a singular meaning any more than any singular work of art has one meaning. There's different ways of 
appreciating art. Uh, there's different ways of appreciating and working with dreams. And just like artworks have multiple meanings to multiple people, uh, dreams can have more than one meaning as well. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And thank you again for for your writing. Thank you for making time to talk with me today. I've learned so much and I've enjoyed it. I'm already telling my friends about, about the book. So I'm grateful for that. And if people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, assuming you, you're you good with them doing so, what would you have them do? They can email me. Yeah. They can uh, just reach out and uh, yeah, let me know what their thoughts are or what they what their questions are. And to the extent possible, I always try to, to reply. Awesome. And is this Antonio? I know people can find you at antoniozadra.com. Yeah. What's the best email for people to use? They can use antonio.zadra at gmail.com. Yeah. All right. That's great. I had a really, really fun time exchanging with you today. Yeah. Uh, yeah it me was too. a lot of fun. Uh, great questions, great connection, good vibes is my silly way to put it. But I think it's people understand what's meant by that. Yeah. Uh, and I say it really genuinely. So, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. It was I feel a pleasure. that too. Yeah. Likewise. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or who live in conflict zones, there's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community, get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at brianmiller.com or by visiting goodliving.com. 